you will notice that I'm not Tom Stellard. Um, this is to Tom came up with this idea, and we all thought it was a good idea. In fact, it was such a good idea, we suggested we could also do it at the LLVM developers meeting. Um, that's not going to happen for some pra practical reasons, but we ended up with a bigger, bigger panel. Um, and just a quick show of hands, how many people in this room also work on LLVM or have worked on LLVM? Yeah, so, so a significant proportion of this room. Um, and we can sometimes get into a them and us mode. And really, since we're the same people, getting into them and us when we're both sides is a bit silly. And the idea here is to come up with some practical ideas for how we could improve cooperation. Um, so I'll ask each of the speakers to introduce themselves, um, and then we'll open the floor for discussion. But I've got a slide, um, actually originated by Tom, of areas that we can start by considering. And at the end of this, I've got my colleague Craig taking some notes, and I will actually write up you know, the outcome of this discussion as a blog post so we can start a conversation going. Can I ask you one thing? This is all being recorded. If you want to say something, put your hand up, and we have people running around with microphones to make sure you're preserved for posterity. So I'm Jeremy Bennett. I run Ember Cosm. About half our business is GCC. About half our business is LLVM. This year, it's slightly more GCC. For the last four years, it's been slightly more LLVM. So we are actually quite keen on both projects being very successful. Um, uh, so that's our, my interest in this. I'll hand over to uh, Nathan next. Hi, so you know me. Uh, Nathan Sidwell, one of the C++ maintainers. Um, uh, I have hacked on LLVM, front, the Clang front end, for a bit, for about two or three months from one project. Um, and um, I actually work very closely with the uh, Clang maintainer, uh, Richard Smith, on the modules, C++ module stuff, and some other pieces there. Tell a story about that if people are interested. Hello, Ian Sando. I'm independent these days, but whilst I was working with Mentor, I actually wrote two back ends for LLVM and uh, done a fair amount with the middle end and a bit with the front end. Uh, I have a, an out of tree port for Darwin PowerPC for LLVM, which is on my GitHub. That's just a fun thing to do, right? So, um, yeah, I'm, since I work with Darwin, I, I have to live with LLVM whether I like it or not, and I do quite like it sometimes. So, uh, yeah, interested in both. Okay, so the areas that we thought we could identify for cooperation were around language standardization, around maintaining ABI compatibility, about interoperability between tools and libraries. So it doesn't matter which compiler you use or which linker you use, it should all nice work nicely. And about what more communication channels can we open up to make sure that the two communities actually uh, talk effectively to each other. That's the area for discussion. Um, anyone like to kick off with some comments or suggestions? Uh, so one thing I've heard various uh, well, the community, various parts of the community being needled with constantly is uh, uh, their failure to build an upstream Linux kernel. I know they're getting they're fixing various things, but one of the things things that blocking them usually is they is that kernel uses a lot of really cool GCC features. LVM doesn't always use, and there's things like uh, machine constraints that are slightly different semantics depending on and their backend specific. Um, stuff like that. So I wonder whether what we could do to be to be able to build an important project like Linux kernel with two compilers, because that would improve it considerably. Oh, okay, good point. And, uh, any more? Any other for the panel like to comment on that one? Yeah. Um, the constraint thing that you've just described is part of the you know. The history of GCC is that those constraints were, were kind of internal uh, internal implementation details that escaped into user space without adequate documentation or or description of these are ones that are safe to use and those are ones that are not safe to use and it's a horrible accident of history. Um, I don't know how to fix it. 
Uh, in uh, this point about maintaining ABI compatibility, uh, do you plan to talk only about binary ABI? Because sometimes uh, we have issues with uh, compatibility, for example, with uh, coverage binaries. For example, GCOV is not quietly compatible with coverage used by LLVM, and they have very useful tools, for example, for fuzzing, which is based on coverage. Uh, these are very open bullet points. They're just a start discussion. Perfectly valid point to, to raise, yeah. There are some vexing situations with ABI. There's no two ways about it. Um, one that recently came up for discussion was the atomic handling side of things. Uh, sadly, I mean, I don't think that's the fault of any compiler. That's because the chip vendors, if they're in the room, haven't written their PSABI sections, which means nobody has got something official to follow. So one thing the compiler community could do is to identify where there's an absence there and at least agree on what the sensible plan is. As far as ABI now going forward, I can say absolutely for certainty with the thing I'm working on, which is coroutines, the three compilers that care about this, including Visual Studio, all their engineers are getting together and talking about it. There isn't actually any problem at the engineering level. It's all going quite smoothly. So that's the best. The suggestion I can make is if the compiler engineers notice that the PSABI is missing a demand on what they should do, then they need to get together and persuade the chip manufacturers to fix that problem. Speaking of uh, ABI issue, actually, we are currently run into one ABI issue uh, with particularly with LLD. Uh, that is about the uh, support for Intel CET features. Uh, we defined ABI two years ago, and we implement ABI in the uh, basically mostly in the linker and the similar mostly in the linker part. Uh, we Intel submit a patch to implement ABI for LD. The problem is the LD maintainers particular one, he didn't like the ABI. He wants to make change for something we have been Void for a while now. So here we have a thing, so we have a patch for LD, but it didn't go anywhere. And LD has no support, of course, for the new Intel CT feature. But the good thing is, it will not break anything. The binary will still run, but if you use LD, you will not get protection from CT. So I had an uh, impression the LVM community is not a very key in support uh, to, come to be uh, ABI conforming. They have very issues with ABI, not about, just about CT, with other, say, I32, especially 32 bit ABI on x86. And uh, what there are a couple, more than one, I think two or three. And I think last one, I, I don't remember exactly what it was. So our VM is divided into two camps. One is saying, oh, we are going to maintain the ABI, whatever they have incompatibility for a couple OSs. And the other, the other camp is, oh, we are going to conform to the ABI. So what do we do about it? <laughs> I, I do not have an answer for that. Uh, OK. Um. So as a background, this is to do with um, structure returns for AVX on um, x86, and in particular that the historical ABI that um, LLVM implements returns in um, MMX registers, whereas in principle it should return in memory according to the description of the ABI as it exists. Well, this is an example of an example of why we need to try and solve this problem because 
the reality is that that ABI now exists in several versions of MacOS or whatever it's been used in, um, FreeBSD as well, and you can't retrospectively undo it. So all you can decide to do is to change it at the next possible interval, right? And you're saying that doesn't look like it's going to happen, or? It would change the GCC behavior. It would change. Uh, no, 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 I'm not suggesting that. GCC is doing the right thing. We, we agree on that. GCC is doing what it should do. And, and in this particular case, LLVM is strictly not obeying the ABI. However, you know, they have the same problem, right? If they fix that, it's going to break backwards compatibility with several versions of the OS. So this is why we need to not have the problem in the first place. So um, just going back to the ASM constraints uh, question, um, just, just to tell the obvious way forward, there seems to be to collaborate on built-ins, say start with built-in syscall, would enable the kernel to build, and try to get those patches into the Linux kernel, of course, and work from there whenever you see an ASM doesn't parse into LLVM or whatever. It's a good point. I mean, we've seen it with, just in a niche one, the um, the RISC-V support for uh, the bit manipulation extension, which is very, very new, and which GCC um, has an implementation, thanks to Jim Wilson and others, actually then pushing up to the LLVM community to say, for your... Oh, okay, is that... Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yep. okay. It's hard to, okay, right, so the, um, the challenge is then for the um, LLVM community that when they do their bit manipulation version, which is going on, is to say, when you're having that discussion on Fabricator about the built-ins, here's the list of built-ins for GCC. And it really would be a good idea to have exactly the same set of built-ins on both. And that ought to be a two-way discussion. Um, it's early enough, actually, for the LLVM guys to say, GCC, you're right at the beginning, can you change yours as well? And it's that level of dialogue you want. But by and large, I don't see particularly a lot of evidence that the built-ins are different between the two compilers. They have tended, th there does tend to be a underscore, underscore GCC built-in, blah, 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 in, in the Clang implementation generally. So... Uh, Coming back to the processor-specific ABI issues, there, there are multiple issues, right? Uh, what one is if the ABI maintainers, of which I'm one and HA is one, and and there's a other group of interested persons, if they don't disagree, well, then then there's a problem. Of they don't agree on something that is new to the ABI on how to specify it, and then of course there's the problem if already an implementation exists, then. Obviously, there is a, there is a incentive of just specifying whatever is already implemented. So okay. that is one problem. The other problem is um, how to deal with things that come come up after the ABI was written, which is, for instance, with the atomic stuff, right? Yes. It's new in C C11. The X8664 um, ABI is much older than that, and of course. Um, probably no one except maybe the Risk Five or the ARC64 people can say that they actively still change their PS ABI document and and by monitoring new language features and thinking about how to actually map that to uh, to the to the machine, which is uh, certainly what happens with the x 664 ABI, right? I mean, it, it, I never thought about Atomic, and now suddenly there are two compilers doing different things. And, uh, well, problem, which is exactly what you talked about. The right way would have been for the compiler guys getting together. Well, unfortunately, I'm one of them, so I, I'm partly to blame, of course. <laughs> um, um, going to the ABI people and asking them, okay, well, let's, here are our suggestions. That would, this would be the optimal way. And please write it into the ABI so that there's no doubt anymore in the future. And then, there, of course, there's the problem, third one, the, the, the returning of, uh, of vectors in registers or memories, where, where there is a specification in the ABI by the compiler uh, for, for probably oversight reasons, uh, implemented something else, and then after five years noticed that, and then, yeah, what to do? It's, it's already all fucked up. Um, it's hard, hard so, things. Um, Comments will go unknown. 
we actually had the same issue on the GCC side in the, for the same ABI. We've changed our implementation, added warnings, and did the change. So, um, you know, I, I think uh, if it's definitively incorrect as far as the written ABI is concerned, then it's up to the that community to try and adjust their compiler to deal with it. I, it, we all know that that's a pretty damn painful thing to do because you can't fix it retrospectively. For my money, guys, maintainers of the PSABI for x86, I think it would be great if you guys went in there and wrote what Atomic should do. And then it's up to us to fix the problem. Uh, for, for In this particular case, I think actually LLVM does a better job than GCC. So, whereas with the structure return, it's the other way around. So that's the way the cookie crumbles, I guess. But until something's written in the PSA, uh, PS IBA, nobody's doing anything wrong, and we're stuck. So I would like to say when um, uh, when something is new, then LLVM and GCC should con uh, should cooperate to make whatever good, de good definition, whatever good way to do things. But for things like uh, register constraint, uh, that we, uh, f for us, us on, right? Uh, that uh, that GCC already has had for 20 years, for over 20 years, we are not going to change, right? Uh, 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 the, other the, other, the other thing that comes up for PowerPC a lot is uh, uh, the command line flags. We have pretty straight, strange command line flags in places, but it's not going to, to change because uh, we've had them for over 10 years. We are not going to change them. If LFAM is going to implement the same names with different semantics, that that is going to be everyone's problem. So this shouldn't happen. Uh, 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 LFAM, uh, uh, if something uh, has existed in GCC since dawn of time, whatever, uh, uh, when LFAM wants to implement something like it, it should either be the same semantics or it should be a different name. So I'd, okay, but I'd, I would add to the, I would say that your the, se the several problems I'm picking. I'm picking that. I mean, LLVM is no longer a new compiler. I mean, the original paper's 2003, so it, it's got something like 12 years of you know, having a serious organization. And where stuff is new, that's something we can solve. We can get to a culture of talking to each other early on. That's the easy one. Where one compiler has something and the other one doesn't, then when the other compiler puts the something in, it's good for them to pick up what the other one does for compatibility. But there are a number of places where both compilers have the same prob have solved the problem in different ways over the years. And if we go past the compiler and look at the two debuggers, GDB and LLDB both use remote serial protocol to talk to remote targets, and it's almost but not quite exactly the same. And you can't change, say, you change to mine or me to, because one of you is going to break. And there, I think we have to have creative solutions that allow both to coexist, um, because neither side is going to go and upset their legacy that way. And so, so Jeremy, yeah. I, I've... Over here. Sorry. Uh, that's all right. I've got the mic. Um, I worked for quite a while now on the ARM ABIs, um, and we structure them essentially as two main layers. We have the architectural ABI, which defines the basic things like the procedure call standard and then the register, the register batting and data layout. Um, and then we have on top of that what we call the platform ABI, which is Linux or Android or you know, say Mac OS or something like that, um, FreeBSD, um, which is a layer on top of it and defines a, a set of additional things. You then get the compiler. Now the compiler will try to implement both of the ABIs that are specified, but occasionally there are mistakes. So you get into the point where the incumbent compiler for that platform defines the ABI. And at that point it becomes a, a requirement if you want to put another compiler onto that platform, you have to conform to the ABI that that platform really runs, not what a document says. But we I, run into this I, all the time because 
no compiler implementer is perfect. They all read the document, they interpret it one way when it was intended another, or simply they just missed a requirement. But once it escapes into the wild, ABIs aren't for Christmas. You know, no. they, they are for life. I agree. And, I think and so yeah. essentially, if something has been in existence for a while, you just have to accept it's going to be that way forever on that platform. Unless, of course, that, a, that implementation is self-inconsistent. I agree with you on that one, I think. Um, Joseph, you've been at the back there trying to speak for a while. Yes, the PSABI thing leads into a general question about development policies and architecture maintain of responsibilities. So, say you've got some new language feature which requires an ABI choice for all 50 or so architectures supported in GCC. So, the person adding the language feature can make some default choice, but ultimately, architecture maintainers need to decide things, get things maybe into their ABI document, coordinate with other compilers, whatever. So what, I, what should the conventions be for when we can pass things off onto architecture maintainers and say, OK, for this new feature, every architecture maintainer needs to do something or needs to do something if they want a result that's not whatever default we've chosen. So let's say, as a case in point, for the past few years, there's been a proposal floating around for C. Maybe C should add a type short float. So if C adds the type short float, then every architecture needs to decide, basically, do you make this the same as float, in which case it's fairly clear what the ABI will be, or do you make it IEEE half precision, in which case you need to choose what the function calling and argument passing and so on will be, or do you do something else? So if you add that sort of thing, well, you can do a default for, that says, OK, by default, it's the same as float, it's, unless architecture maintainers do something else. But what, what are the conventions about passing things off, ensuring that architecture maintainers do actually make such a decision and coordinate on it with other compilers for the same architecture? Getting to just that particular point, I would argue that if a middle end or front end, uh, at the middle end and front end level, a feature like that is added that requires the backend to make a choice, I would argue there should not be a default. That as long as the backend maintainer has made an explicit choice, that feature should simply not be supported and error out to the user. Because we have been bitten in the past by things where features were added and it was just had a default. And we only noticed a couple of years later when it was already sort of out in the field and might have wanted to do another choice. Yeah, I mean, and that, that, that makes sense to me as well. I mean, you can't expect, if it's the big architectures, I mean, the, the dynamically and actively supported chips, you would expect that the vendors would have an interest in supporting making a sensible choice. In the case of the half float, I imagine all the GPU guys are going to be pretty interested as well. But at the very least, we should ask our, um, if you're going to implement something, you should at least discuss it with the other open compilers, I guess. So to that end, over here, um, and I have to smile at the, uh, the intersection of the set of British people and people working on LLVM and GCC, which it seems to be one-to-one. -one. Um, <laughs> Richard and jo Joseph. Uh, are there any structures in place to ensure the people who are going to work on features in GCC that are intended to, or ideally, work compatibly with LLVM, that those developers are actually asked to go and talk with the other community? Um, I don't... There isn't an organization that does that for you. I mean, for the module stuff, I've been talking to Richard because we've both been there at C++ meetings and I've been to the Google to talk to him and um, uh, you know, discuss how we're going to do things. Like, for instance, that's got a C++ API stuff in the mangling. So we've now extended the mangling. I've got the document on that and Richard and I have gone over it. However, one of the interesting cases that came up is because Clang has already implemented implicit modules to in essentially their version of variant of PCH. The, um, he ran into problems with um, compatibility with our libraries. 
like the Atomics Library, the POSIX G threading layer, and some other places. And he told me about them, saying, "You're going to hit these problems. <laughs> this is what's going on." I like, "Oh yeah, I see. I, you know. When I hit them, I guilted Jonathan Wakeley into fixing it. <laughs> but for some reason, Richard didn't feel he could do that. I've been trying to, and so I think it, you know, it, it requires, you know. People with a with a foot in both com communities to be known, so that if you're working on some some new architecture, at least ha you know reach out to somebody in in the GCC community who might know somebody in the LLVM community. Understood. And Just I think that would be a useful thing outcome of this is is that people then know who to ask, who who might know a person, which in most cases in open source will work brilliantly. I just wonder whether we need a a policy stated. So that folks are clear that this is not kind of an optional thing. You really ought to be yeah. building something in that's going to be good for for general users, right? Which is what all this is supposed to be about. Yeah. And perhaps even a um, agreement to have common test suites, right? Not or common tests across features that are going to need to be in, uh, compatible across the two. Right. Just a yeah. little bit more of a stronger statement. Yes, I think we've. I think actually the one is being built for modules in that particular case, and somebody's running it on both compilers. Um, but yeah, it would be nice to make it clearer to people that are not in this room. Hey, if you find a problem with our thing and and you're on using your compiler, you can still file it as a bug against us because it might, and you know, in the cases that we ran into, those are yeah, the code is actually wrong. It's just harmlessly wrong in the implementation that we have. It's about to not be harmlessly wrong, which is why I need to fix them. But yeah. Okay, we have. Um Joseph at the back, another uh, Jason at the back, and then one at the front. Uh, uh, jo uh, Joseph, then Jason, then. Yeah, so if you, if last. you say that you don't enable some feature by default for various architectures, that brings its own problems because then you've got the additional complexity in the compiler for it to be optional, all the complexity in the test cases for it to be optional. Then you get users of GCC expect things to be available on all architectures. So then you get suddenly Debian say finds a package is using this because it works on x86-64 and it's broken the build on lots of more obscure architectures and so on. So that brings in plenty of problems of its own. Y yes, but I think, I think having the compiler loudly shout at the user or that, that this isn't implemented, go complain to your compiler vendor or provider, is a much better failure mode than silently making up the wrong thing. Well, to my mind, you should, it's not silent, but we should have some protocol say for you, you file a bug against each architecture and CC the architecture maintainer, and then it's their job for the next release to do the decision or whatever. Some standard way of saying this requires architecture maintainer action for the next release. So I think that should be some, there should be some development rule to that effect saying, don't break, at least keep GCC building, but you can then do something that at least keeps it building and maybe also X fails any tests that will fail until architecture maintainer stuff is done. But then there should be some rule about what you should do to hand something over to each architecture maintainer saying you should work out what you actually want to do on your architecture for this feature. As a, this is as a development process question. There is the, uh, the multi-vendor C++ ABI group as well that uh, has tended to uh, avoid saying anything about uh, processor specific issues but uh, Yes, it does does make sense to me that in in the case of of newer features where the PSABI uh, groups might not have had a chance to uh, to say anything about the features, it might be good to have something of a more of a kind of a default or or placeholder in the in the C plus plus ABI document. It's the the C plus plus ABI group is. Uh, fairly low volume at this point, or just a, a GitHub site. Uh, used to be a mailing list. Originally, we had face-to-face -face meetings, but that was a very long time ago now. And uh, it, the, the people were saying about, uh, about test cases, I think it, it would be nice if, uh, if along with the ABI document, there were 
some test cases as well. So Jason, would it be safe to say that without the test cases, the ABI document um, is just a document? If, if you don't have the test cases, you can't actually stand behind it and say, yes, we're doing the right thing. Didn't we already run into this with the multi-vendor ABI? Or we didn't initially have the test, tests around it. Say, so if it ain't tested, it's broke. Exactly. Um, to partially answer Matt about the forum side of things, um, the chair of EWG has been pretty good at making sure he asks the implementers what their opinion is. Um, I don't attend WG14, so I can't say that that is the same there. But that's a good forum where that can be kicked off. Oh, sorry, evolutionary working group for the working group 21, which is the C++ side of things. So when a new feature is being introduced, they are actually being quite proactive in checking that the opinions of the, of the implementers and the chip manufacturers who attend WG21 um, that's not a bad starting point, but maybe a, maybe a formal group would be a good idea. No. So to speak to that point, I have two thoughts. Um, one, to your point about WG21, uh, the issues that are being discussed are, uh, have a parallel between the two languages, C and C++. Um, and those issues are, are uh, the resolution of those issues is formalized by um, each of these uh, language standards groups having a liaison uh, to the other uh, to the other language, and so there's a formal process, semi-formal process, uh, whereby the two language groups communicate with one another and try to prevent these kinds of mishaps. Um, they still happen, but <laughs> there is a process. So one thought is uh, should there be a similar process or a similar body um, that tries to help recon reconcile or prevent these kinds of issues um, from coming up between the different implementations on Linux. And, and uh, my other thought that led me to my other thought is, um, is the uh, Linux Software Foundation possibly such a body? Uh, and does GCC, I mean, is that body even active? I don't know. Um, but does GCC have a representation within that body um, and do the other compilers. It's not limited to GCC and Clang. There are other uh, compilers that run on Linux and that are that strive to be compatible with one or both. Um, is there representation within those bodies where uh, these kinds of issues should be channeled? So the, the LLVM is run by the LLVM Foundation and that is definitely a legal entity and it has a, a, a Board of Directors is chaired by Tanya Latner. Um, it has a set of four pillars that it tries to achieve in developing compiler technology. So it has an organization. I'm guessing the nearest that we have to that, but it's a completely different beast, is the, the steering committee. But, I mean, the steering committee is not really the same thing. I mean, it might be worth, is David here? Yeah, that David. <laughs> Your thoughts? I mean, we can definitely consider utilizing the steering committee for this sort of a role. I, um, you know, it's simply a matter of formalizing our steering committee in some sense has tried to delegate a lot of this to the release managers and to the uh, global maintainers as far as the, the technical details, but with whichever way we I wish to move forward. So WG14, WG21 a few months ago started a liaison mailing list for people concerned for issues where a new feature is being added to both standards to try and make it compatible. I'm on that mailing list. It's not exactly been particularly active so far. I suppose one thing I'm saying for these discussions is should there be some sort of mailing list for making decisions what should defaults be for PSAPI issues in the absence of an act in the absence of anyone actively maintaining an ABI for a process or something like that. On the other hand, do we need a separate list or should we use the GNU Gabby mailing list that we do in fact already have that was intended to work out ABI generally for, for GNU systems? So that's dealt with things like extensions to ELF and so on. But 
is that also suitable, should we say, for open source compilers that want to make default PS ABI decisions for any future features like Atomics or whatever? Is that a good place for saying we should discuss here what the defaults will be for architectures that don't have their own active PS ABI maintainers? I, I think Jason's suggestion of the, uh, the multi-vendor C++ ABI mailing list is probably the, the best place to at least start that to ask that kind of question, because the, the people who, who are on that list will be interested in the answer to the question that you've just asked, and it's it's an existing thing rather than making a new thing that people have to then find yeah, out maybe about. Maybe I just the uh, GNU ABI mailing list is, is also an existing thing, and well, it tends to be simply lower level than CXX ABI. C++ ABI things. Although it is not used very much. That's right. Yeah, I thought you said it was a GNU, GNU mailing list specific. New. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I misheard. What, yeah. Yes. GNU hyphen G A B I. So it's originally right. intended for, say, additional L features, but. So I imagine if people want to implement those features in LLD, say, they ought to be on this mailing list if they want it to be compatible with GNU linker features. But it might be reasonable to use it for other features relevant for CABIs. Okay, I'm just going to switch back to the GCOV comment that came up earlier. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it was Diego that implemented it for LLVM. <laughs> So, um, he's a pretty approachable guy. Uh, my suggestion would be the first thing to do is just to approach people and say, is there a way we can resolve this? I personally am burnt by it as well. I have a problem with destructors not running in the right order on Darwin, so... <laughs> Uh, okay, basically my question uh, was not exactly about uh, GCOV. ABI. Uh, I mean that uh, actually it's not so hard to port it uh, to one side or another, but uh, everyone is talking about just uh, uh, runtime calling ABI. I mean, uh, if we plan to have something in common, maybe we should consider tools ABI too, not only just uh, function calling. Um, yeah, and you, you have reminded me that the GCOV stuff explicitly says in its documentation, this is an internal implementation detail of this version of this compiler. And so they, they've already stepped outside the documentation. <laughs> no matter what you write, people will do weird things. Yeah. Um, so I would like to ask for a cl clarification. So um, the Linux kernel does not build Clang because it is not written in C, it is written in C with extensions, and those extensions are Linux extensions. And no extensions are documented in the GC documentation. So do we accept the responsibility that it is our documentation that binds us and not our implementation? And when our impl implementation differs from our documentation, it's a problem in the implementation. And we cannot, for instance, hold LVM responsible to implement the new extensions in a bug compatible way. And they should implement, imp imp implement extensions in a way that the documentation promises them to work. So um, one way forward from, from that would be like the obvious. If there's a name involved, use a new name and deprecate the old ones. If there's a version in identifier, same thing, new version, deprecate the old ones. Whenever possible, of course. I guess that needs to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. We, we can't just say the documentation is golden and we can't have bugs in the documentation because we have many. And, and sometimes uh, the actual implementation is so important that we really want to change the documentation to match the implementation. And in, uh, in other cases, the documentation makes a lot of sense and we just made, made a mistake in the implementation. 
but the thing is that often, often even if we document something and have implementation which does something, the same thing, and then somebody comes and implements it in another compiler that they implement actually something completely different anyway. But uh, the users, the users only have the documentation to work with. But most of the users don't read the documentation yeah. anyway. They they just try what 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 actually works, and yeah. so so the implementation is usually more important. Than users the will observe the fe the behavior of the implementation regardless of what the documentation says. It would be nice if the documentation was specific, but it I think you know it's you can't make a general rule. Yeah, that's about uh, uh, my my remark as well uh, documentation is usually not good enough at all to actually describe what happens what is done so uh, so if if some other compiler implements or documentation uh, there are like thousands of ways to implement or documentation and none of them are the same as what GCC actually does and GCC has done this thing for for like over 10 years or whatever in many cases and uh, uh, lots of programs rely on it, so we cannot change it anymore. Even when a feature is specified in a standard, you can get the different implementations interpreted in different ways. So yeah. take, for example, C11 underscore generic. GCC did one thing, Clang did another thing. Some de defect reports, which took several years to resolve, eventually WG14 concluded that what GCC did was right and Clang changed to match it. But even though they were both going for exactly the same standard document, we still ended up with different interpretations of how underscore yeah. generic should behave. I'd like to um, just steer the discussion now in what I'm picking up on Matt's point, which is I'd like to come out at the end here with some practical things that we can start to pursue and we can talk to our opposite numbers in um, LLVM community about. I think we've touched on some of them about mailing lists and discussion for you know formal online where we can talk and I think that's important I'm conscious that the people we have in this room who do both compilers are one group of the people we need to involve but we also need to involve people who only do GCC but need to know about LLVM and conversely we need a forum to involve LLVM people who don't know anything about GCC I think those of us who don't do both we can talk to each other, that's not a problem because we, we're not afraid. And I think some of that comes down to not mailing lists, but drinking beer. It's actually that it's not, you know, the, you know, some person who's got an email address. It's my mate Jeremy who poured beer all over himself down in a, in a, in a beer keller. And that makes a big personal difference. It breaks barriers. Now, I'd like to sort of sound out what sort of forums work. Th four years ago, we in Hebden Bridge, we ran an LLVM cauldron the day before GNU cauldron, and there was a 40% overlap in attendees. And I do wonder whether we ought to be actively trying to resurrect that for future cauldrons to bolt a day on one end or the other, which is an LLVM day to encourage both communities. We talked yesterday about the idea of a FOSDEM dev room well, there's an LLVM dev room at FOSDEM. Should that be a, if we've got a cauldron in the autumn, should we have a spring FOSDEM where we try and get both communities, ideally in rooms adjacent to each other, if not in the same room? What are your thoughts on all those? Suggestions that we can take away and start talking about putting in place practical steps. Hans Peter. I applaud that. Um, maybe a fund for beer? Well, <laughs> if I'm involved. Uh, anyway, um, okay, so bring up a new subject here, um, address sanitizer, the, the common libraries we, where we use. Help, I have a pat patch stuck in limbo. It's a local, it's committed to GCC, but I, I don't know the exact steps to have it upstreamed to the LLVM library. Um. Are you asking for a specific or is it a generic question? Are you uh, I'm generalizing. Generalizing. I, I think that's a, a good question. Actually, part of that needs to be, if I'm in the LLVM community, how do I talk to the GCC community? And if I'm in the GCC community or the GNU community, how do I talk to the LLVM community? And they are different styles. You know, LLVM uses Fabricator. We use patch mailing lists. 
and uh, so we have different styles and different approaches and different expectations on who reviews and so forth. So I think that is another area we need to look at. What can we do? You know, what, what's, what's the, what, do you have an idea of what the way we might solve that is? So, we've lost enough time. so I, I'm not sure if hijacking the LLVM room or the GCC room at FOSTEM is a good idea. The target audience is, is not somehow compatible with, with FOSTEM my point of view. So what uh, the Open JDK community did last, or no, this year, was to have a, um, uh, a committers workshop uh, following FOSTEM on Monday. So uh, that was external to FOSTEM, but um, I think it was a very productive day. And uh, so you could get all the people visiting FOSTEM uh, interested in, in Open JDK together. So something like that might work better. I wasn't actually suggesting hijacking the LLVM dev room because I was thinking of also having a GCC dev room so you get everyone in the same time. Um, Simon has got his hand up. Uh, I was just going to add, in, in, instead of hijack, uh, adding a GCC one or hijacking the LLVM one, why not, because the LLVM one's usually sorted around the LLVM conference, why not propose then not having an LLVM or a GCC one, but having a LLVM plus GCC track. Yeah. That, that's certainly something to have a conversation with them about. And I know lots of projects have their meetings adjacent to FOSDEM because you've got all the engineers in Brussels anyway and doing things on the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday beforehand actually works quite well. And of course, if you put a critical mass of GCC and LLVM people there, on the Saturday and Sunday, then that makes that even more attractive. Um, so I'm, I'm, others are welcome to as well, but I'll talk to the guys I know in the LLVM community about the FOSDEM um, next month. Um, I'm going to kind of answer Jeremy's thing because he said what specifically to do. Um, general solutions are great, um, and getting people to talk to each other is a good idea. But I actually think that I would recommend everybody recognizes that we're all engineers and so are everybody else working on the other compilers are all engineers and when it comes to engineering problems you can just talk to them so the best solution to many of these problems is if you think you have something which is unique or a problem is to try and find the person on the other compiler and and just approach them directly because they're just an engineer the same as all the rest of us, right? And when we've been in the same rooms together in, in all these various places, it, there's not been any us and them syndrome that I've observed. And maybe as a continuation of this idea, uh, is there any list maybe of uh, compatibility issues because as far as I understand everybody talks about his own domain of responsibility he knows all peculiarities but if uh, we want to set up cooperation we should have at least uh, maybe points for discussion because I, I think everyone has uh, internal list to what he wants to fix uh, in compatibility between uh, compilers but uh, if uh, you want to start a discussion between both communities, I think there should be some kind of material to start with. I have one data point on that. Um, I did get asked that by a customer, so someone actually paid me to answer. And I looked at the command line options to GCC and Clang. And I think when you allow, add for all the, you know, the various ch you know, scheduling parameters and tuning parameters, there between them there's something like two or two and a half thousand options and there's a core overlap which is the ones everyone uses of about 1500 which are in both compilers and there's between 500 and a thousand that are in only one compiler now a lot of them in the LLVM compiler are there so you can put a GCC command line in and it doesn't break and the options do nothing um, but it turns out I, I tried to write it down and actually the customer didn't want to pay for that much work and you know just telling them that the scale of the problem was sufficient but it is actually for big projects can be quite a listing all the points of where you could have compatibility it turns even that's quite a big problem and um, very often 
the simplest thing to do is you raise a bugzilla on both projects and cross-reference them. Nobody has a problem with that. Um, so what, certainly what we did with the ABI thing. <laughs> so, so maybe we need some channel when new warning options are added, which is something which we should try to think on so that we actually implement the same options for the same features rather than different options for the same feature and, and so on. Or for the uh, for when built-ins are added, so have some channel to communicate this to the other uh, that, group. That's exactly what and I've that done. can be either mailing list or it could be even a bot which scans the repositories and whenever you add a new built-in or warning option, you mail it to the other group. Well, that's it. The built-ins are exactly what um, Ian has done with the co-routine stuff. Ian, myself, Richard, and uh, Gore had lunch wrote on napkins um, for the module stuff. Richard and I have conversations. Which is why the, the, it's F modules TS because there's F modules in Clang and that means something different. Yeah. Sometimes we think on without actually doing some cooperation like GCC comes with a built-in for some C++ 20 feature and, and then uh, LLVM implements the same thing or vice versa. But sometimes we can come up with the different names and nobody figures out until it's too late and so on. I, I, I can say one thing that does work is to try and reach out with things where you can make the other person's life easier. And some of you will remember, we've had a thing going on for two or three years now where we've been trying to take the GCC regression test suite and make sure that all the Deja GNU test you know, suitability are completely compiler agnostics. So they don't say, you know, they don't assume GCC ability with the idea that you can actually put out of the <coughs> box, put Clang LLVM in and run the tests and you won't get a thousand failures because it says this thing isn't producing Gimpel. Um, you know, by trying to make the, the tests that and um, I'm not sure how far have we got Simon on that? Yes, sir. So the yeah the last set of numbers I think we have is something like two hundred uh, maybe two or three hundred remaining failures across uh, C torture and DG tests. So we're most of the way there, except it's probably needing to tweak different things for each one at this stage. But and that's, an that's, example that's just one direction and perhaps no, no, that, we need that, that the, the other direction as but well that's and the it's point even harder. I'm, that was the point I was making. Sometimes there are things you can do in one direction which don't need your partners and it shows willing and builds trust by saying we're not replacing you, we are making our stuff really easy for you to use. Oh, those GCC guys are actually quite friendly. That actually is part of that trust building. So I would encourage people where that opportunity is available it helps to build a relationship um, uh, and, and so forth. I'm just giving you this example. Just to add to the list um, of built-ins and other features, there are also attributes um, that uh, are arguably even more important in terms of portability or compatibility between uh, multiple compilers or implementations. Um, and as a side note, uh, recently there was a paper uh, posted to uh, one of the standards mailing lists that uh, uh, did a survey of the number of built-ins in, uh, I think, GCC alone. Um, the study counted about on the order of 2,000 built-ins there. So it's a fairly, uh, the scope of the problem, uh, trying to maintain compatibility between multiple implementations seems like a fairly large problem. Uh, admittedly, many of those were the vector uh, built-ins that are target-specific, but still. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a hard problem, so we're not going to solve it overnight. And GCC and LLVM are both very big programs. Uh, can I just, I, I did throw out something. Can I just get a show of hands about the, I didn't f hear and over, how do people feel about the idea of tacking on an LLVM cauldron day to the GNU cauldron? Is that something that people thought, is it a one-off we did once and, hey, it was great and that's it, or should we do it, try and do that more regularly? Wait, wait. Oh, well, well, So I applaud the idea in principle. I think the worry is 
um, that 40% of overlap, was that because you had a lot of GCC engineers who were already there for, for the GNU tools quadrant and, and they were just interested in learning more about LVM or, or being there? The ideal, from my perspective, would be that there's a way for the two communities to come together with an overlap between their, relative, their respective events. That would, to me, foster a greater dialogue. Um, I, I think there's a strong element of that. I think because it was organized by Alex Bradbury, who some of you know runs the LLVM weekly mailing list, I think it actually was quite successful in actually genuinely pulling in LLVM people as well. Though whether those were the 60% that didn't stay, stay over the rest, I don't know. We, we didn't do enough statistics on it. Uh, uh, I want to ask, uh, uh, I, uh, you ask how we feel about it, but do you mean we should raise our hands if we like the idea of, or if we don't? Um, I, I, well, we could do a show of hands. Hands yeah. up all those who think it would be a good idea. Hands up all those who think it would be a bad idea. Hands up those who haven't put their hands up yet. <laughs> right. Okay, so it looks like we're sort of probably slightly in favor and slightly don't really know um, and about equal and then no one's really opposed to it very much one I think we've had one or two opposed to it so we'll take that way and think about it and sit, digest and take it away um, we have two minutes left before it's the end of cauldron any last comments perhaps I'll ask my two fellow panelists I'm done <laughs> I just encourage you to talk to your counterparts because they're pretty good guys, most of them. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you for coming along to this session. Uh, I shall write it up. I will take away the things we've taken here and talk to opposite numbers in LLVM. And we've, I'd encourage those of you who've got good LLVM contacts to talk there. And that's the end of this session, and it's the end of Cauldron. Thank you very much. Thank you.